Hey, and welcome to the Shiny Happy People Duggar Family Secrets After Show. I'm Roberta Blevins, and I will be your host. I make content on pyramid schemes, cults, frauds, and scams. And today we are going to be talking to some of the survivors and experts to hopefully get some of those questions that you still have answered. I am joined by ex-IBLP members Floyd and Tara Othout, Lindsay Williams, and Brooke Arnold. Will you share how long you were in IBLP and how long you've been out? I was in it for 10, 11 years, uh, from about the age of eight till roughly 20. And my story is a little bit different than Floyd's. Uh, my family was not directly involved with it, but we used the curriculum. So it was a massive part of my upbringing for my entire childhood. Lindsay, how about you? I was in ATI from the age of eight to about 22. And then I've been out for 23 years. I was in from about 10 years old to 17, around 17. So what made you want to participate in this docu-series? I mean, primarily the impact that this entire thing has had on our lives individually and as a couple has been monumental. It was, you know, a part of the foundation of who we are and, you know, affected the way that we were able to adult and uh, be in the world, have relationships. And so when we found ourselves on the other side of, you know, deconstructing both of us individually, and then finally able to meet on the other side of it together, it felt like a very important story to share. It, there was so much baggage and trauma that we worked through and that I had carried for so long. I felt compelled to share what I could in able to help tell this story so that other people would hear it. So my main reason for doing the documentary was to stop abuse that um, I had experienced a lot of it growing up. Some of it seemed like microaggressions. Some of them seemed like major aggressions because I was experiencing them. But also when I went to headquarters, I experienced a lot of other abuses. And the older I got, once I was out of ATI and IBLP, I realized that there was also a lot of neglect, like the educational neglect and social neglect and things like that. And so I just, I wanted to be able to have a platform in which I could speak about this and also just raise awareness to it on a general platform or raise awareness to the generality of the dangers of homeschooling if it's not done with oversight and thoughtfulness when it comes to just the educational academics that your children need to to thrive in the world. And how about you, Brooke? Um, so I first started talking about IBLP and Gothard in 2015. I published a Salon article in which it was a first-person essay talking about my experience of growing up in ATI and this IBLP church and tying all of the abuse that I saw within my church to the teachings themselves. And when I published that, I got this avalanche of responses from people all over the world who had just absolute horror stories of being involved in IBLP. And it really just touched my heart. And I really felt this need to uh, speak out on behalf of everyone that suffered through this and to to kind of stand up and say, hey, you're not, most people aren't really aware of the abuse that's happening here. Most people aren't really aware of the horrors that are happening here, especially because you know, the Duggars create this illusion that everything in IBLP is hunky-dory and great families and good Christian morals, but that the teachings themselves are so rife with misogyny and abuse that they put children and women in vulnerable positions, um, no matter how you come in contact with it. Absolutely terrifying. It really just an incredible documentary. What was the hardest part um, of sharing your story? Is, can I can I add something to the our answer too? It was like so in like invigorating to hear Brooke and Lindsay that I just I wanted like we wanted to share our story from the perspective of of how it impacted our lives, but I wanted other people to know they were not alone. Exactly what Lindsay and exactly what Brooke were saying because it was so isolating going through it, and it was you are on an island and it the the shame. And is just like, so shame dies in the light. And we wanted to drag it out and let people know that they just were not alone and that they could do it too. If we can do it, oh, 
anyone can know. <laughs> I'm just saying like, it, it, they, I wanted people to know that I'm standing beside them. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, now I forgot the actual question. <laughs> No, absolutely. And it, it leads right into it. So tell okay. me, what was the hardest part about sharing your story? Oh my gosh. There's, I'll let you answer first this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, potentially pissing off very powerful, well-connected people uh, <laughs> that never entered my mind. Um, I mean, it, honestly, for me, it was laying out my life story and giving, literally handing it to a bunch of strangers who are making a documentary. And I had no idea what they would use and how they would use it. And, you know, maybe we're uh, actually the villains and it's going to be a pro IBLP story. And they tricked us. <laughs> Flip the script. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I couldn't say how much Amazon and the producing company earned our trust in the way that they respected us, handled our story, everyone's story. Uh, and I couldn't be more grateful. I just gonna, you know, counter with what he's saying is it's, it's mind boggling to sit down in front of cameras, in front of strangers and go, okay, I have no idea what the end result of this is going to be, but I am trusting you and Olivia and Julia and Bly and court just like, it's so humbling how protected we were at the end of it, but we didn't know that going in, yeah. you know, these are all very new people. And so that was such a, I don't know, an there, honor. There's a fear of rejection from friends and family as well. That was very palpable that day. Oh my that gosh. We, that we filmed yeah. and it's borne out <laughs> in, in our life now. Yeah. I, I agree with you on just the protection of, of working with this team. Yes. My own experience as well. Also, um, Alicia and Lauren at Amazon, just incredible, incredible, wonderful people. So Phenomenal. grateful just are taking care of to give us the platform to give this the platform and for it to be what it is like, we were just the little guy. And because of Lauren Anderson and because of Alicia Russo, we've been given this platform to speak out and to give these people who were on that island a voice. Yeah. How about you, Lindsay? How do you feel? Because of my background, I suffer from a lot of anxiety and uh, panic, which I'm working through with a therapist, thank goodness. <laughs> but even for me, it was just even the getting on the airplane to fly to where we had to interview. I was so nervous. And I, you have so much time to question your choices at that point. And I really thought about, you know, what Tara and Floyd just said, that this is going to impact my immediate family. This is going to impact people that are still within this system. But I also had to remember that it will impact the people that are still being abused. And that to me was the greater, the greater cause was to stop the abuse and to raise awareness to the insidiousness of what Bill Gothard has taught, that it didn't just happen to IBLP and ATI followers, that his system permeated throughout so many facets of Christianity. And it, I, again, in telling my story, I didn't know what would happen to that story being told. I didn't know how it would interlace with everyone else's. And I was so elated to see how they made a collective story out of everything that we all said. And of course, even like leading up to the documentary coming out, I had so much anxiety and I just had to go back into relying on all of the production team and the executive producers and the editors and just know that if I was brave enough and vulnerable enough to tell my story, they too are being brave and listening and finding that perfect way to tell this story so that it would be effective and clearly it's working. I had actually uh, worked on my own documentary project about IBLP and Bill Gothard um, for a couple of years. And so when Corey reached out to me and was like, hey, you got a choice. You're going to jump on this train or you're never getting on the train. And I was like, wait, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know? And I, I was really torn. I actually, I played very hard to get with her. I, I made Corey pursue me. I talked to, uh, 
cast members from Lula Rich. I talked to people who didn't agree to be. She was really smart and put me in touch with some people who didn't agree to be in Lula Rich and regretted it later on. And hearing those stories, you're like, I don't want to be that person, you know? So you kind of end up in this little catch-22, right? There's a huge potential personal fallout from speaking out, from family members, from community members, you know. I know that in the past when I've spoken out, my father's gotten angry phone calls from people from our church, you know. And so not only am I the person that has to deal with the fallout, but family members do also. And that kind of, bur the burden of carrying that is so extreme. I think that there's also for me, Personally, I've experienced a lot of gaslighting. So if I say this happened to me, then, you know, people from my, you know, church and family have the tendency to minimize that. Oh, well, we weren't that involved or we were just kind of doing that. You know, we that was kind of a brief period in our life. And so having the strength to say, okay, no, I believe this happened to me no matter what it's anybody said, and I'm going to sit here in this studio, and I'm going to tell the world that this happened to me, uh, can be just incredibly scary and incredibly overwhelming. And I think for me, it's the fear that nobody's going to believe me. It's the fear that everyone's going to see me as only a helpless victim. And also the, the fear and difficulty of being dragged back into this world. I never wanted to be a part of this. I never, you know, I never signed up for this. And somehow still so many years, decades later, it's still coming up and it's still a part of my life. And so I think for me, the hardest part ultimately was just reinserting myself back into this world. How has life changed since the documentary has come out and that you recorded it? Well, I'm now on IMDb. <laughs> surreal uh, the moment we found out some a friend texted my what tara that's and, me yeah i'm used to saying my way uh, a friend texted tara and i heard a shriek and i ran in thinking someone had died or something was awful and finally she muttered we're on ideal i were uh, on I, imdb and uh so yeah that's weird yeah um other than that, uh, I think hopefully now all of my coworkers know why I overshare. I have like no social boundaries and I'm just weird. Uh, that's, that's the crux of it for me. Um, so for me, uh, a little less chill than uh, Floyd's representation here. Uh, it, More existential crisis. So I would say that in my deconstruction up until that point, I was at a place where I could participate. I understood that I didn't agree with some of the ideologies that I'd been handed through IBL, you know, books and teachings and curriculum and that, and that nature. But uh, when I walked out from filming, it was like, I, the way I describe it, it was like, I'm walking down this path of deconstruction. And then all of a sudden the, the road gave out from underneath me. It was face to face, hearing it all so concisely, listening to Floyd speak, you know, hearing the questions and then just like simmer, like simmering in it. Looking it in the face for the first time yes. in its entirety. In its entirety. Yeah. And so that started, uh, 2022 was a brutal year for me. And uh, it was incredibly painful. It was so hard. Uh, and I still struggle so much with my own worthiness, but I will tell you what I I'm strong, like, and that's not something that I probably could have even said the day of filming. Like I was there, it was so scary. I was moving through the actions of strength, but I sitting here today, I can go, Oh my gosh, I nearly lost me. I lost the foundation of who I was. The very fabric that, that made Tara Tara was gone. And so that's, that's difficult. And I still have so much work to do. I still have so much therapy to do, but I'm so grateful that I'm in the place that I am to be participating in these interviews, to have been able to receive the documentary the, the way that I have been able to. It's hard. None of this is easy. It just, but there's no going back. No, no, you can't see it the way you Never. can't see it the same anymore. Mm -mm. I would second what Tara and Floyd said, because you can't put it back in the box. Like it, it, it is out. You can't unsee it. And when I 
gave my interview back in February of 2022. I can't believe it's been over a year and a half since I uttered all of my truths, but I I went through a lot more therapy. I'm, I do EMDR therapy. I'm uh, movement desensitization reprocessing, and it felt like clockwork orange uh, movement for my life. <laughs> And I have done a lot of things that I realized were requiring bravery of me. And people kept saying like, oh, like my close friends that knew I was doing this, like, you're so brave. You're so brave. And I'm like, brave? I'm terrified. And they were just like, bravery only exists when there's fear because you have to push through that fear. And that is where bravery resides. So as the documentary has only been out for one week, I I have felt the shift. Oh, I have goosebumps. <laughs> I have felt the shift go from cur- from bravery into courage and realizing that now my voice has been heard and the reception has blown my mind. I, I sorry, I'm getting goosebumps everywhere, but like it's blown my mind that has been so accepted. And at the same time, it breaks my heart because it's being rejected and defended. And there's a brick wall within the souls of so many people that I care deeply about within my internal relationships. And yet my bravery that has led to courage says, I deserve to have this voice. I deserve for my narrative to be true, no matter whether one person believes me versus 10,000 people believe me. And I, I just have to continue to walk forward in this and own what I have basically like laid out on the table. You're incredible. You already know that though. Brooke, I don't know how you're going to follow that, but try. Honestly, I don't really feel like my life has changed all that much um, since it, since it came out. Um, I feel like there's definitely a huge number of people who are reaching out and saying, I grew up in something similar, or I grew up in actual IBLP, I grew up quiverful, I grew up in the Christian homeschool movement. And so I think for me, what's really changed is kind of realizing how how far of a reach this has. I know that that's like a general thesis within the film is that Bill Gothard had this enormous reach. But until you're actually in touch with literally thousands of people who are saying like, hey, I lived this, you don't really realize it because it's not really something that you're meeting in real, you know, like encountering in your everyday life. And I think for me, like a big change has kind of been this weird contradiction of suddenly being well known for something that again, I never wanted to have anything to do with. And so it's, it's kind of funny, like you grow up as that, that weirdo homeschool uh, kid in the long dress, you know, who doesn't go to school, you know, when every stranger asks you what grade are you in, you're like, what's a grade? I'm on wisdom booklet 13. What are you talking about? Is that a grade? And so you have this kind of, you don't have this uh, touchstone, I think, really. And so suddenly kind of feeling like not only you're an insider, but that you're part of this really large, large group of people that you never even realized exist is very exciting. It's exciting, but also very surreal. Incredible, incredible answers. Thank you so much. So my final question for you all today is what advice would you give your younger self today? Looking back. One of the things that I kind of realized is that for me personally, uh, looking back at any, any age of me as, as a kiddo, uh, because of where I was at, I know that I would be disappointed. And I know that sounds like such a brutal thing, but that's just how deep the, uh, ideology goes and the thought process. Oh my gosh, in the future, I become of the world. What, how does this happen? Where does it go wrong? How do I make it stop? But at the end of the day, I I don't think I would speak to the girl. I would speak to the shame. And I would say that you have no business here and that you are worthy and you are loved and you are enough and your gut instinct and your discernment is enough. One of the tools that perpetrates this type of ideology is us versus them mentality and conspiratorial thinking and I think I would have encouraged my younger self in 
that critical thought in and that not everybody is out to get you not everything is a giant science isn't a giant conspiracy uh you it's real <laughs> <laughs> um also get the hell out like run like just just go <laughs> Lindsay, any advice for your younger self so like i was echoing i'm gonna echo what i said earlier because of emdr I have actually had conversation with the younger part of myself and I, she's a very angry girl. And I basically had to tell her that I was sorry that I left her there, that I had to leave and be gone for a while and allow that rage and anger to stay in a very locked down place so that when I was strong enough and I could see the path that was truly meant for me, I could come back for her. And so that younger self, I would say, hold tight because I am coming back and I will find my strength for you so that we can live the best life that we're meant to live. Whew. What would I tell my younger self? Oh, probably take mushrooms, touch some grass, girl. Come on, you know, get outside a little bit. <laughs> That's what I'd probably, that's, if I'm being really honest, that's probably what I would tell myself. I think that growing up within the Gothard cosmology, you're taught to think that the world is ruled by Satan and evil and bad things and that bad things are just going to happen. You get out from under your umbrella and bad things are going to happen to you. And of course, when you leave, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're so sheltered and naive that, of course, bad things happen to you as soon as you're thrust out into the world. And so I think if I could talk to that girl in this moment, I would tell her just to have faith in something larger than yourself, no matter what that looks like, if that's people, if that's a community, if that's spirituality, if that's mother nature, if that's just going for a hike, it's, if it's meditation, you know, touch, touch something that's larger than yourself, especially because I feel like we were so hollowed out by those teachings. I know that I spent a really long time in my adult life defining myself by not being that. I I'm not a submissive woman. I'm not a Christian. I'm not this. I'm not that. Um, but I had no I am's. And so when I got a little bit older, I realized I need to define who I am apart from that, um, not following it or not wholly rejecting it. But I feel like if you build your life around rejecting something, then there's only going to be a lot of emptiness, or a lot of empty space left. And so I wish I could tell myself to younger self to have faith that people are good, have faith that people will help you if you ask for help, that people will believe you if you speak up about what's happened to you and to find things in your life that that bring you love and bring you positivity and fill you up um, rather than defining yourself um, in this reactionary, I'm not this state. Lloyd, Tara, Lindsay, Brooke, thank you so much for your honesty and being so candid. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For our second segment, uh, we are going to be hearing from some of the experts that you may remember from Shiny Happy People. So with me today, I have Jen Sutton, Kristen Dumay, Daniel Lindemann, and Alex Harris. Uh, before we dig into our questions, can you all tell us a little bit more about your credentials and what would make you an expert in this field? I'm a historian of American religion, and I'm the author of Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. I run a YouTube channel called Fundy Fridays, where I talk about different aspects of Christian fundamentalism culture, politics, and the new generation of evangelical influencers, um, the Joshua generation, as we talked about a little bit in the documentary, and I try to connect the dots and help help people understand how all of it's connected and what we can do with it. Danielle? I am a professor of sociology at Lehigh University, and I'm the author of the book, True Story, What Reality TV Says About Us, which analyzes reality TV through a sociological lens. And Alex. Yeah, I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm a graduate of Harvard Law School, uh, and my expertise comes from lived experience. I, I grew up kind of at the forefront of the Joshua Generation movement, uh, the son of homeschool pioneers, and have navigated this world for almost my entire life. 
Wow. So let's get into it on that. Uh, What piqued your interest in this particular subject? Kristen, let's start with you. I initially uh, had little interest in Gothard or his spaces. I set out to write a book about mainstream evangelicalism, mainstream ideas of masculinity as they're intertwined with militarism. I was looking at James Dobson. I was looking at John Eldridge, author of Wild at Heart. And as I was doing this research, I kept running into people who would tell me, you are going to look at Bill Gothard, aren't you? And I kept saying, no, 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 he's fringe, right? I, I don't want to discredit the study. That's that's not really, I'm, I'm focusing on the mainstream. And then finally, after so many people told me that, people I had no idea were kind of like part of that movement or influenced by that movement, I thought, okay, let me take a look here. And as soon as I started looking into the sources, I knew I had to center Gothard because I had no idea how influential his teachings were far beyond the kind of extreme spaces, the homeschool spaces, the, you know, people who actually sat in his seminars. But those ideas had really kind of infiltrated American evangelicalism. And I saw how they ran parallel to slightly milder versions like James Dobson's ideas of authority and hierarchy and gender. Uh, But I I realized that we had to bring Bill Gothard and his teachings, really radical teachings, into our understanding of American evangelicalism. Like first started being interested in the Duggars and that world as a child. Um, I was raised non-religious and I'm also an only child. So seeing these big families on TLC just blew my mind in every way, shape, possible. Um, And so I was always curious about how people of other religions lived. And in my area of the Midwest, the the kind of default culture was evangelism. Um, We have a lot of Baptists specifically in my area, but um, so I was always kind of on the outside, but like all my friends, everybody I knew were into that kind of stuff. Um, And even though I went to public school, we still had like assemblies about modesty and abstinence um and i thought that was just like everybody does that right (laughs) um and then i also just like culturally was just around it like um this is gonna age me but when i was a teenager um christian emo bands were really popular um and so i've been to quite a few of those concerts and like it just was kind of involved with it but not really, you know, believing it, but I just thought that was uh, interesting, my connection to it. So I just, as an adult, started reading into the, I started going on Free Ginger, um, and then that kind of opened my mind to, oh, the Duggars aren't just quirky, there's like this insidious, uh, you know, system of abuse that's going on, and that really kind of took off from there. Danielle, how about you? Sure. So my research is on reality TV. Um, First and foremost, I am a fan of reality TV, although I do understand some of the ways in which it can be problematic, as we can see, as came out in the documentary. Um, But when I say that I'm an evangelist for reality TV, which you heard me say in the documentary, it doesn't mean that I think everybody should watch or like reality TV I don't own stock in Viacom. I have no stake in that. But I am an evangelist for understanding the importance of reality TV. It's something that a lot of people tend to kind of see as like a cultural sideshow, this kind of unserious form of entertainment. But when something is this much of a cultural juggernaut and so many people are watching and so many people are absorbing and so many people are learning from it, I think it's kind of important to take out the magnifying glass and start paying attention. Yeah, so my my interest and, and focus is really on the Joshua generation piece, which is kind of the, the mission within the Christian homeschool community uh, in certain segments of that community uh, that... Christian homeschool graduates would rise up to take positions of power and influence in government and law and media and and beyond, uh, and in so doing would take America back for God. And my interest in that is that that was my life mission for most most of my life. So starting in high school, my twin brother Brett and I were national champion uh, speech and debaters in, in the homeschool speech and debate leagues. Uh, We started a nonprofit organization to inspire and challenge teenagers to rebel against low expectations, wrote a book, uh, put on conferences, worked on political campaigns at the 
local, state, and federal level, and and really in many ways we're following the blueprint of the Joshua generation uh, to to a T. Um, my pursuit of that path eventually led me to Patrick Henry College, uh, which was uh, a school originally designed for Christian homeschool graduates uh, to train them to lead the nation and shape the culture and to place them in top internships and positions within the federal government and uh, ended up at Harvard Law School and clerking uh, first for then Judge Neil Gorsuch uh, and then for Justice Anthony Kennedy at the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, all all in pursuit of and, and fulfillment of that, that mission. And over time, uh, as I've continued to reflect, as I've continued to, to read my Bible and, and listen to, to teachings from pastors and other wise men and women who, who did not come from the same background that I did, uh, I have increasingly grown very concerned uh, about that mission and the ways in which uh, it's, it's dangerous, it's, it's distorting of, of the truth of Christianity, and, and therefore uh, I, want to, I want to speak up. And, and tell that story. So I have a question for you guys. How does your own relationship with religion shape your work? So I grew up in a Christian home, but not in any way directly influenced by Gothard's teachings. I'm still a practicing Christian today. I teach at Calvin University, but um, I've kind of described my, my faith upbringing as evangelical adjacent. So kind of on the edges, but not at, at the center of evangelicalism. The popular culture certainly influenced me. You know, I listened to uh, Christian music, Christian radio, and, you know, some of these popular books kind of made it into my home. We listened to James Dobson on the radio from time to time. So, uh, you know, it, it, I wasn't from completely outside, but I also wasn't located at the center and certainly not of Gothard's teachings. In fact, my mom once told me that when I was like a baby, like one year old, and my brother was three, um, somebody came to the playground in my small, Iowa town and told her that she was raising us wrong and that we needed more discipline. And they they handed out some information. And as she recalled it, um, it, it was it, it very much seemed like it was Gothard uh, teachings. And so she's a new parent, didn't know, wanted to raise her kids as Christians. And so she and my dad, who's an ordained minister, like talked it over. They prayed about it. And then in the end, they decided, nah, <laughs> you know, we're not going to do this. So kind of dodged a bullet there. But um, so so I grew up next to this. What that means is like I have an understanding, but it's not deeply personal for me. And so I haven't had to go through the same kind of deconstruction process, I think, in terms of my relationship to this. But I have a, a, a great deal of, of curiosity and sympathy for people for whom this was their world and this was their understanding of what was good and true. Yeah, I'm going to go to Alex for this because I think you probably have a lot to say about this. Yeah, I, I apologize in advance if this is if this is really long or meandering. Um, I I am a, a practicing Christian. You know, my my faith has not changed fundamentally uh, as I've kind of evolved in some of my thinking on how Christians relate to politics and and culture and and how some of these ideas that that made up the Joshua Generation movement were were distortions um, of of true Christianity. Uh, but I was. I was so fortunate, you know, to grow up with parents who I may have some serious disagreements with on certain things, but who who very clearly cared more about my soul than my success, and who taught me to follow Jesus even when it's hard, uh, even when it means going against the the flow of the culture that surrounds you, um, and and who taught me to follow God and and love my neighbor, and those. Those core principles remain, uh, even though I now have some real, you know, deep concerns about uh, the Joshua Generation idea and and the way it it puts hope in politics and it conflates earthly power with a future kingdom that that Jesus talked about that is not of this world. Um, and I think, you know, as I've reflected on this more, you know, when when Jesus was on Earth. Uh, he was, as he began to be viewed as the potential Jewish Messiah, he was actually expected to be a Joshua, a conquering hero who would help God's people reclaim the land, throw off Roman rule at the edge of a sword. And uh, what he ended up being was a suffering servant who associated 
with the poor and the marginalized and the outcasts and opposed the religious leaders of his day. And so my journey and all of this, my reason for speaking out on all this is, you know, we never were supposed to be like Joshua. We're supposed to try uh, to be like Jesus. Wow. Uh, Jen, how about you? Well, I have never been a Christian um, and I come to this world as an outsider and I really try to be respectful and, and hear from everybody. And I think that the way that it affects my work is that since I don't have religious trauma, I can take it. I can take whatever these systems want to throw at me, these religious people. I get all kinds of comments, DMs telling me I'm going to burn in hell and it doesn't bother me. And I just really want to be there for my followers. A lot of them are deconstructionists. A lot of them are still Christian. And I want to be able to take that abuse for them in any little way that I can. So that's how it affects my situation. Yeah, I don't know if it's as relevant to me, but I think it's interesting. I too kind of see myself as re as um, religion adjacent. I was raised Catholic. My mom is still very Catholic. And I think I was able to kind of see both sides of religion growing up, what, what harm it could cause, but also how affirming it can be for so many people. And so I think in our research, it's always important to think about how our own biases might shape our research. But I think that kind of distance that I have from religion allows me to be able to kind of see it as kind of more of a sociological subject rather than being emotionally invested in it. Uh, my next question, I think, is is probably going to be more geared towards Jen because you're in this space. But what can you tell us about the response to the documentary within the evangelical spaces? So short, in short, they're pissed in long um it really feels like a lot of them think that this documentary was a direct attack on Christianity. Um, and I don't know if it's, you know, lack of media literacy or like cultural or, you know, peer pressure or whatever, but they're, they're not very happy with it because they think it's a direct attack. And, and that's clearly not what it was about. Yeah. The, a lot of them are doubling down. Um, I, the, you have this interesting, uh, you have the camp that I'm from, you have a lot of people that are, um, fighting against it and then you have like the Paul and Morgan types that are uh fighting for it and it just seems like it might come to a head soon I don't know I think this documentary was the start of something big at least on the internet um so I'm on Twitter a lot and so kind of Christian Twitter which is uh kind of dominated by people who are either deconstructing or or at least certain spaces of it are, or, or open to deconstructing and more critical. And so that's where I see this overwhelmingly positive response to the documentary saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've gotten so many notes from people just saying, thank you for, for helping people understand my life, what I experienced, because it's been so hard to communicate to people on the outside. And I do see some of that kind of critique of uh, this is an attack on all Christianity, but immediately other people will pounce and say, well, you're kind of telling on yourself if this is your version of Christianity, right? You know, and so there's a lot of people saying, no, it's not, and no, it shouldn't be. So it's a really healthy dialogue that I've seen or a healthy, healthy conversation. I will also say that, you know, I'm connected to a lot of survivor communities because of my work. And there the response is overwhelmingly grateful. And, and that to me is really important. You know, when you're part of a project like this, you don't really know how it's going to come together, how it's going to land. And that's all I need to know, really, to know that this project is, is a success. Alex or Danielle, have you noticed anything in your spaces? I'm still very much within the evangelical space, um, both my connections and, and, and otherwise. And, and so I've been really, in many ways, encouraged by the response thus far. I think there's a tendency uh, within the church uh, to not listen to people who are not within the walls, um, and especially to be dismissive of people who have left and who it feels like are just you know throwing stones at, at something that they've they've rejected. Um, and and yet, uh, I was invited shortly um, after the the trailer came out to 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 write a review. Uh, on the Gospel Coalition, which is one of the largest online platforms uh, in the evangelical space, uh, and to encourage people, don't look away. Looking away is how these, these evils happened in the first place. 
And yes, it's not perfect. And yes, you're going to think that maybe they didn't characterize things completely fairly 100% of the time. That's okay. Don't miss the forest for the trees. And uh, the response to that article has been overwhelmingly positive among uh, evangelical friends uh, of mine, which has been very encouraging. Uh, I've also been able to talk about this uh, on a podcast with Christianity Today, another very large uh, evangelical platform uh, that you know was very much taking seriously the concerns uh, raised by the documentary and recognizing that no, uh, this doesn't have to be an attack on all Christians, but it is a wake up call for all Christians to say, what, what evils are we turning a blind eye to? Um, how is a desire for power or influence or you know, the, the shininess of big crowds uh, blinding us to the reality of, of actually uh, speaking truth and caring for the most vulnerable uh, in our communities? And so that's, that's super encouraging. And then the last thing I'll say, um, and, and most personally uh, gratifying for me is just how many members of the Joshua generation have have reached out to me and who have gone on similar journeys uh, as, as I have in kind of rejecting uh, the mission that we were entrusted as kids and saying, no, uh, there is a different way, a different motivation, um, a very different way of thinking about what it means to love our neighbor and to be involved in seeking the good of our country, our nation, um, our communities, that is not this version um, of Christianity that was advocated for and, and really pushed within some segments of the Christian homeschool world. Yeah, I mean, I'm just surprised that I haven't gotten any hate mail. Um, not soliciting it. It's it's all good. But um I I have only received an overwhelmingly positive response to being involved in this project. I mean, and it is kind of shocking. I've received hate mail for other things. I once wrote this like tiny thing that would critique Disney in like a tiny way, and I got death threats for that. So I, but I think it is kind of telling that I've, I've really only received a positive response to this. And I really hope that's true for the survivors as well, because right, ultimately this is, this is not about me, right? This is, this is their story. Is there anything that you wanted to mention that wasn't featured in the documentary? So we've talked some about this now already, but one piece of, of the Joshua generation story that, that I wanted to make sure, uh, was included and, and that we did talk about in the interview, but there was so much, so much good stuff uh, that had to be be fit in a, a four four episode series that, that that segment ended up being a little shorter than anticipated. Uh, and and the the, the good news, uh, hopefully, that would be um, encouraging to people is is just the fact that so many members of the Joshua generation, you know, specifically those who who actually have succeeded in in achieving positions of, of power and influence, whether it's in the media or government or law, uh, so many of them, the vast majority, uh, have rejected this mission as they've grown older. And that is a reason for me for hope. Um, there are exceptions to that, which the documentary talks about. There are Madison Cawthorns, and there are others like him. And so there's a reason why we need to be talking about it. There's a reason why I'm, you know, in some ways making a you know, public appeal to, to fellow members of the Joshua generation to say, look, um, reconsider, there's a, a better, more biblical path here. Um, and yet there is much reason to hope. And, and I want to make sure that, that people know that as well. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that, and I'm sure Kristen can speak to this as well, but I, one of the things that I, I spoke a lot about in my interview was not only femininity, but also masculinity and how this type of kind of heteropatriarchal system that we see on the show can really be a trap for men and boys too, not just for women and girls. And I know a lot of the focus um, in the documentary was on women and girls, and that's completely understandable. Um, but I think it's really important to point out that like under this kind of system, the kind of roles for what is acceptable and possible for men and boys are also really narrow and really circumscribed. And so if you fall outside of that narrow box for whatever reason, right, because you're neurodivergent, because you're not heterosexual, because you're non-white, right, the list goes on and on, or just because you just don't fit, then there can be dire consequences for you as well. So you know, in some, I guess a lot of people lose out within such a patriarchal system, not just women and girls. Anything to add, uh, Kristen? 
honestly, the series covered so much ground and, you know, knowing what went in and I think all of us gave very long interviews and then your know, little pieces get in and then they get woven together. And I was actually really impressed just how much ground was covered. I, I think just a, a couple of things. One, how it, it came through some, but, but just how people get drawn in uh, into these systems. In, I mean, you can be born into it, but also, you know, this is this kind of high control religious system is packaged and sold as just plain old Christianity, right? So people who who are converted or people who, you know, are, are at the park and somebody comes up to them and says, oh, no, that's not how you raise your kids. This is how you raise your kids if you're Christian. You know, it just, it's very seductive. It just pulls you in because, I mean, if you're, if you're a person of faith, you want to be faithful, right? You want to do things right. And this is handed to you. Here's the blueprint. Here's the books. Here's the rules. And so it just pulls people into the system. I think that, and I would also say, just to reiterate, the this, this kind of paradox of sexual purity, sexual morality, and how that absolutely sets women up for abuse and for not even knowing that it's abuse, right? I mean, I, I think one of the participants said something in the, in the documentary about, um, I mean, abuse doesn't even exist. The concept doesn't even exist for women in these spaces because of the way this is framed. That's extreme in those spaces, but there are certainly echoes of that throughout evangelicalism, this um, kind of patriarchal culture. What are a woman's obligations? What is a woman to blame for? And, and the system makes it extremely hard to identify abuse, to resist abuse, and to walk away from it. I want to leave you with one final question. What do you think is the single most important thing for people to know about fundamentalism? And we'll start with Kristen. Oh, single most important is really hard. There are so many things. You know, one thing I would say that the fundamentalist logic is if you aren't with them, you are against them. So it just separates the world into, and if you aren't with them 100%, you are against them, you're against God, you're on the side of the devil, right? And this is the way that they see the world. Um, and, and so any kind of critiques, any, you know, quibbling or any, uh, you know, questioning, immediately that places you on the outside. But I would say for people who are on the outside to keep in mind that looking in, uh, if you're talking about, you know, all Christians or, you know, all evangelicals in, in, in a particular way, in some ways you're playing into that and, and you're playing into their hands and you're kind of bolstering that. That's exactly what they want. And you see this in the response to this documentary as well. The critics who are saying, see, they're attacking Christianity. They hate us. Right. And, and so I think the challenge is, uh, I, what I love about the, the series is, is the sympathy that we have. We hear from people on the inside. We hear from survivors. We understand the logic and we see the courage that it takes people to walk away from the system, from these systems. And But that takes some time. And so I think for those on the outside to come alongside and to walk with them and to offer support and to be a little bit more strategic in what they're doing culturally, politically, to try to combat this um, ideology writ large. I just I always think of things in terms of the internet because that's you know what I do and I would say that it's really important to know that it the fundamentalism is still around and it's being repackaged. Um, you know I come from the the influencer world so that's automatically what I think of is all the new hashtag movements and the the glossiness of it on and the curated things on Instagram and and just how easy it is to fall down that pipeline especially if you don't know what's going on because yeah everybody's offering some sort of answer uh and it can be super easy to listen to it when you don't know and that's that's kind of where I come from well, I'm certainly not an expert on fundamentalism like all these other folks are, but I think that the show did a really great job of showing just how widespread fundamentalism is and how kind of long its grasp is, how long its reach is. And it's not just this kind of wacky Duggar sideshow. It's really kind of more insidious and broader, and it goes further than we might believe. And Alex. I, I would echo 
what what Kristen said first and foremost, uh, which is to have some understanding and some sympathy you know, for the fact that so many families who do get caught up in these type of, uh, whether you call it fundamentalist, which is a, a bit of a squishy term, which is used differently in academic, theological, and popular settings. Um, but but the way that, that families get caught up in this really is because they want to follow God. They, they want to do what's right. And they're told this is how to do it. And it's, it's kind of a one-way ratchet because when you're in a community of faith, and you see someone who's doing more and going farther and taking scripture even more literally, the, the, the tendency is to think, well, I'd rather err on the side of obeying too much than, than disobeying. And so it can be easy for communities and churches to kind of slowly move in that direction in ways that eventually lead you somewhere uh, with all these rules, um, all of these ways of dividing the world, which are not in the Bible, um, and which are the very type of, of religion that Jesus himself opposed when, when he was on earth. I just want to say thank you, Kristen, Jen, Danielle, and Alex, so much for coming and, and sharing all of your knowledge with us. This was really eye-opening. Thank you. For our final segment, we will be hearing from Deanna Duggar and Amy King. But before we dive into this, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with IBLP and where you stand with them now? We've never really uh, stood with IBLP. That was never our background. Thank God my mom never raised me like that. And so for us, it's just we can't support anyone that's in it um, if it's going to continue to be evil and hide and lie, right? So for us, um, it's a pretty clean break. And we decided that healthy boundaries are really important. And that's just what we're going to do to obviously protect our peace. Um your grandson, my son, you know, our, our little family. Um, and that's kind of where we stand. I completely agree with you. Uh, So what made you decide that you wanted to participate in this series? Well, I decided when I heard some rumors about what was going on with the IBLP, I wanted to be a part of this to explain to people, I'm not with the IBLP. (laughs) I mean, yeah, I think it's all about just exposing the truth. I think that so many people were deceived in so many ways and no one really knew what was really happening. And that included us, by the way, we didn't know either. And so when we found out, just like the rest of the world, we were like, okay, this needs to be shown on a a huge platform with a huge spotlight because obviously darkness cannot hide in the light. So And the survivors are the most important thing of this documentary and hearing their stories and getting the word out to other people to realize that they can come out of this. They can be free. (laughs) Yeah. Absolutely. How does your past affect your everyday life now? It doesn't affect mine. (laughs) It doesn't affect mine either, honestly. I mean, it sucks that we don't get a chance to like be with our family members um, because we still love them. We might not agree with them and we are going to stand for the truth, but as a, as it's hard, it's hard because we still have all those memories and all that stuff with them, but I don't think it really affects it. It's just, we're going to be more cautious about who we're around and who we allow, obviously, my son to be around. That's the main point. If you're not going to protect your children, then I have to protect mine. So I guess it's safe to say that you don't really talk to Jim Bob or any of the Duggar family anymore. We talk to the ones that are out of IBLP and the ones that are healing. Yeah. Have any of the family members reached out to you because of this series? No. We've had... Well, no. except for Jill. Well, of course, Jill. but yeah, but Jill's awesome. Um, no, as far as everyone else know, and that's fine. That's okay. You know, maybe they don't see the, see it yet and they don't see the truth or maybe they don't want to see the truth. But, uh, you know, we're here to expose it. Honestly, the darkness is just, it's just taken over and it's just unreal what people have believed all this this whole time. So on that note, what would you tell people who are in this deconstruction phase with their faith? Well, I would say that I would, I would question everything you were taught, right? I mean, if you're a part of the IBLP and and you have all these like, you know, rules and all these regulations and there's power over you and control. 
I mean, obviously I would question that. Second, I would say, I wouldn't say deter. So I've got a cat that's about to jump on my, uh, jump right in. Okay. He wants to say hi. Hello. There's my Winston cat. Rebel, the rebel cousin Amy has a black cat. That's right. Um, <laughs> no, what I was going to say is, is that, uh, I would say don't lose your faith, honestly, because there is freedom in knowing in knowing God. Um, and it's it doesn't have to be so like legalistic, you we're, know. We're both Christians. <laughs> we love Jesus. We're not against Christianity. It's yeah. we're against the control and the manipulation yeah. and all the dark secrets. Yeah, That's we're tired. We're, against. we're so tired of all the secrets and all the lies. We found out things on Dark Benary we didn't even know. We didn't know that Josh went away three times. We're yeah. like, we didn't know that. Did we didn't know? We literally didn't know that. I'm like, how did we not know that? But I guess I was just in my own world. You were in yours. Like we we visited. We we did all the stuff, but we left. You know, so we didn't. I don't know. We also didn't we were, know about the abuse of my nieces. Oh no, definitely not. We were not. told a totally different story. Yeah, it's just so sad. Just it's so, sad. so heartbreaking. I know. Anyone that's going to cover up that type of like just evilness, like what is going on in your head? Like, are you? Do you have that many screws loose that you think that's okay? It's really sad in the IBLP and how abuse is just like, oh, it's just what happens. It's like, just, it's just horrendous. Ugh. And if I had known, it would have been a different story. Absolutely. <laughs> I will tell you that. We would have, bear would have come out. <laughs> we would have raised some pain <laughs> if we would have known. And I they mean, knew honestly. that. And they knew that. And now here we are with this amazing documentary, Raising Hell and Telling All the Stories and Truths. It happened anyway. He's raising hell. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Honestly, I mean, I like to shake things up because that's how the truth is exposed, you know? And people are, just saw it as a really cute show on TV with a lot of cute kids and, oh, look how well behaved they are. But I don't think anyone knew. And I didn't even know that, of how much they had to break their spirit in order for that to happen. It's just really sad, honestly. I wish this documentary didn't have to exist. That's a great segue because my next question is what you think about the response and, and all of the, the reviews and everybody coming out about this documentary. How does that make you feel? Well, I've gotten so many messages, so many phone calls. Just people are just reaching out and saying, hey, thank you for being strong, Deanna. Thank you for taking a stand, Amy. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Derek. You're kind of yelling. <laughs> She's getting so powerful in her voice. She's like, I'm getting wet. Thank you. <laughs> Preach oh, it. Wow. <laughs> anyway. no, but, no, but it is, it is very true because I mean, it's overwhelming by, to get all that support from everyone. Um, and just to know that the survivors are being validated. That's something I can't imagine living like that and living with those secrets and not being able no one would listen, no one would do anything about it. And it's just like, oh, my, I can't imagine living like that and living in so much shame and fear. And so just to know that that is all coming to light and that these survivors, you know, aren't alone and they are hopefully getting help and getting the healing and therapy that they need in order to like just survive and to heal and move on in their lives and, and to thrive. Um it's really cool to be a part of. It's really, really neat. Yes. I, I just want to say thank you so much for talking to me. But my last question um, is what do you personally think is the biggest takeaway from shiny, happy people? I think what we just reiterated about the survivors, that they're getting to tell their stories and that we're applauding them for taking a stand and saying to the world, hey, you know, we suffered this. We went through this. So we're just, we're very happy to see that they're getting to do. That. I think for me, perfection isn't attainable, right? If something is perfect and all shiny and squeaky clean and perfectly white, something is really going wrong here. And I knew a long time ago, I was like, these people do no wrong. It is crazy. And I just didn't know truly what was going on. And so for me, it's like, okay, you can't hold someone up to that pedestal because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And so I'm glad that there's a microscope on it and the IBLP is being exposed for what it really is. It was such a fantastic documentary. 
thank you for your willingness to participate in it and speak your truth and to help elevate the voices of those survivors. That's what this is about. And I just want to say thank you again. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. We've enjoyed it, Amazon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who participated in the after show, as well as everyone that came forward and participated in the series. I know how hard it is to come forward and share your story, and you are so incredibly brave. We see you, we hear you, and you are appreciated. If you would like to learn more about IBLP, Bill Gothard, or any of the other topics that we discussed today, Shiny Happy People is a great place to start. You can stream the entire series on Amazon Prime Video right now. Hey.